I'd like to begin by welcoming um, those members of the public or press who have joined us today, either in person or watching via the live stream to this meeting of the Community's Social Mobility and Inclusion Committee at New Shire Hall in Alconbury Weald. The County Council allows filming and photography at its public <laughs> meetings, so feel free to take pictures, tweet or blog during the meeting. But can I request that members of the committee and the public turn their mobile phones to silent or vibrate while the meeting is taking place? There's no fire alarm test scheduled for today, so if the alarm sounds, please leave by the nearest marked fire exit and assemble in the car park. So item one is apologies for absence and declarations of interest. Would the Democratic Services Officer report any apologies for absence, Nick? Thanks, Chair. No, there are no apologies today. Thank you. And does any member wish to declare any disclosable pecuniary interest or non-statutory disclosable interest at all? <laughs> there appears to be none. So item two is the um, minutes and the action log. So we're being asked to approve the minutes of um, our last committee meeting held on the 22nd of September um, as a correct record. Can I ask um, any member if they disagree with the accuracy of those minutes? Hilary? Um, I'm not disagreeing, but I just wanted to, to make a point about something that Paul followed up following um, our last meeting, uh, which was about um, the household support fund and um, Cambridge Water being on board and Paul just to say that after the comments of the last meeting um, he went to South uh, Staffs Water the parent company of Cambridge Water and they are now on board so that uh, benefit uh, so it benefits pensionable aged customers in arrears now so I just wanted to to note that that being taken up did I did I did I cover that, Paul? Though? Thank you very much, Gethin. Yeah, yes. so thank um, you for that work. I will pass on to the team the thanks as well. And um, thanks for members for pushing us the extra mile because we had uh, almost uh, almost given up there. So. <laughs> That's good. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well done to the team. So I see no objection to the minutes. So I'll sign them as approved. And then we'll move on to item three, which is public questions and petitions. Are there any public questions, Nick? No, there are no public questions or petitions, Chair. Okay. Thank you. So item four is the Household Support Fund. Um, this is a key decision and will be presented by the Interim Deputy Director for Communities and Ploy <laughs> Employment and Skills, and that's Paul Fox. Paul, good morning. Thank you, Chair. Um, members will recall that the Household Support Fund is funded by the government and exists to target those in most need of financial support, um, especially during winter time. But we are now on the third tranche of uh, Household Support Fund, um, and that tranche runs from the 1st of October until the 31st of March next year. Um, we received the guidance on this uh, tranche on the 30th of September. So the government are getting better. They actually issued the final guidance in advance of the scheme starting this time. Uh, although we did have the interim guidance uh, um, and there wasn't a lot of changes. Um, we have received an allocation of 3.58 million, which is uh, the same as the two previous allocations. And again, this paper, as, as it previous papers, uh, speaks just to our element of the scheme, the application-based scheme, and not the direct voucher scheme, which offers during school holidays, those in receipt of free school meals of 15 pounds per week per child supermarket voucher. Um, that, that scheme in this six month tranche will cost 1.12 million leaving a 2.46 million resource available for our wider scheme, including administration costs. The key points of the guidance uh, for this, uh, for HSF3, as we colloquially call it, um, are at 1.4. Um, and one of the things to note there is that the targets, particular cohorts of the population have been removed. Um, Councillor Cox Condren just mentioned the, um, the scheme we put in place with water companies to make sure we didn't underspend. Um, this time, the, the kind of restrictions that led to that difficulty have been removed and it is uh, we're free to, to spend as we wish and as we direct um, across a wide range of low income households in need. <coughs> we are proposing a number of changes for this tranche that I just wanted to flag to members and one in regards eligibility. We have previously run the scheme based on a 
a receipt of a, a, any one of a number of benefits. Um, the proposal here is actually we move towards some minimum income standards uh, and those minimum income standards are, are based on work by the Joseph Rantry Foundation uh, and Loughborough University. And the idea here is that the cost of living crisis has drug, dragged many more people into financial difficulty, irrespective of their status of being in work or on benefit. Um, and we thought that using this particular set of criteria uh, would be more inclusive and allow access to support for those who might be in work but suffering uh, in work poverty. Um, the table at 2.5 um, sets out, 2.5.3 sets out those amounts. Uh, members will note that those amounts differ based on whether it is a single or a joint household, uh, but also um, significantly whether there are children in that household. Members with children will know that there's no single indicator of poverty uh, and income strain than, than having children, uh, with possible exception of disability. Um, joint applications, if uh, partners do live in the same household and applica applicants shouldn't have um, above £16,000 in savings, which relates to the amounts uh, set for universal credit. Um, we moved away during household support fund two from different voucher and award amounts based on water, gas, electricity to a flat rate. It's simpler to administer, it's cheaper and quicker to administer and to get the support to those in need. Um, and we are also moving away from vouchers towards back payments. Vouchers were causing a number of problems, although they do remain available for those in need. Um, and I'm happy to talk to the detail of that if, if members wish. Um, but we are proposing that our flat rate increases from 100 to 110 pounds just to reflect general inflationary costs. The other main uh, recommendation was that we are talking about resetting. And what I mean by a reset is that during the last months of the first iteration of the Household Support Fund, we had to reduce, introduce a number of restrictions uh, to make sure that we could uh, get to the line in terms of uh, the fund lasting until the 31st of March. And one of those restrictions uh, was to not allow people to um, make repeat applications to the fund. Um, it's now been a year uh, since the first tranche uh, and we um, are recommending that people should be allowed to apply again. The main difference, however, is that Household Support Fund 1 was really about getting money out of the door. We have now through our anti-poverty approach wrapped um, a number of services around the allocation of financial support in the household support fund uh, and the model very much is about using the household support fund allocation to draw people in to a conversation that leads to wider support longer term more personalized holistic support uh, and those offers are things like income and benefits maximization awareness of social tariffs for water gas broadband etc uh, and referral to warmth schemes um, amongst many others um, so we think that we should take the um, the block off and we should reset, but we aren't proposing that people can apply on a multiple basis. Uh, we, we say that it's an, another application and that will draw them into the support scheme that wouldn't have been available during Household Support Fund 1. So in summary, a number of changes. Um, we retain a very broad delivery model um, through a combination of direct application a trusted partner network. We now have 72 trusted partners who can make these awards on our behalf and the clues in the name. We trust them, but we bear the administrative burden of the, um, the allocation um, of, of the support. And also we are going to retain uh, an operational note, um, Age UK as our partner for those um, who are above pensionable age, because we believe that uh, that's the easiest and most accessible application route for that group. And also Age UK do have some specific support for that that cohort um, that they can offer their wide, wider support and wraparound offer. Um, so I recommend the recommendations about eligibility criteria, increasing the standard financial offer uh, and allow a further application with also our um, now customary request for delegation in that we have to land this aircraft on the moving aircraft carrier. We don't spend enough, we don't claim it from the government. We overshoot and spend too much. It's a uh, it's a drain on the council resources and we have to move quite quickly sometimes so therefore the request for a delegation at recommendation d thank you chair thank you very much paul um anybody have any questions you wish to raise claire and then philippa thank you um i'm just wondering about 
the communications uh, concerning the package and whether you feel that you're reaching uh, the organizations and the people who would normally benefit from something like this. And I, I noticed in 2.8.3 and 2.8.4, you're talking about um, the, the methods of communication. I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about those. The evaluation of Household Support Fund 1 told us that most people became aware of it through friends and family and, and, and direct word of mouth. Uh, Household Support Fund 2 taught us something different, um, that for all our communications with the pensioner cohort, um, traditional communications, posters, leaflets, etc., were making very little impact, posters in libraries, stand-up banners in libraries, and what really turned the tide for us in terms of the number of applications, admittedly rather late, was direct mail, when we uh, were able to access DWP data for those on pension credit, and we wrote to those individuals. Um, so we learn as we go, um, and we will, of course, use traditional communications routes, but much more importantly, much more likely, are we going to be able to identify people and write to them. Um, we're working with NHS colleagues about uh, patients that they might uh, identify that might have conditions that are exacerbated by cold that we might write to directly, inviting them to apply. Uh, we will be working with social care colleagues, um, disability organisations, I think, as well, given that there's some guidance in this tranche of the fund that says that uh, we should try and find and focus on, on, on disabled groups. So a shift where we can towards direct mail, because that's proved much more uh, impactful way of marketing the fund in the past. Um, I was also just wondering about the warm hubs, and I think that if, if libraries will be drawn into that as warm hubs, so presumably in that case, posters in libraries would make a difference, would be helpful, because you'll be bringing in people into warm hubs who might be the very people who would benefit from the household support fund. Warm hubs are, are a, a really interesting one, and I should have included them, so thank you, um, because they are people who are presenting as we are concerned about the cost of turning the heating on, we are we can't afford to turn the heating on. So, for example, Cambridgeshire Acre, who are running the warm hubs in uh, South and East Cambridgeshire, um, have become a trusted partner um, so that they can allocate the household support fund, and we've also provided training for the volunteers who will be running their warm hubs. Um, that is an offer open to other districts as well. One I reiterated to one district yesterday because um, they hadn't come back to me. Um, and also our library staff are, are well aware. So it is about trying to find an, a moment of engagement rather than publicity. That said, we are doing traditional things. We're having credit cards printed, which members of staff told us would be um, really helpful. So credit cards, size flash things that we can hand out uh, and give. And uh, when they're up and available, members are more than welcome to those as well. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, Philippa and then Roz. Thank you, Chair, and apologise to all for disruption of a late arrival. Um, this is, uh, I, I thought, a, a magnificent report about a really difficult subject, um, and it shows how much our offices are uh, learning from one another and from the residents and from the councillors, and it's very iterative. Um, Interesting that the posters, although we traditionally go for those, aren't as effective, but obviously we need those too. And those have always been very effective and responsive. Um, apologies if you already covered this, but the warm hubs is something a lot of people are taking interest in and is a way of supplementing what is only a small amount that we can give out through this scheme. Um, the money that is coming for that, could you explain where it's coming from so that I can explain to other people as well as how it can be plugged into? And associated with that in 271, um, the trusted partners, is there a list of the already established trusted partners that we can get hold of um, or access that would be very useful? Um, because obviously they've already jumped through the hoops and there may be others we can that would like to. Thank you. So thank you, and, and thank you for the, uh, the the kind words. I think I'll start with the trusted partner one. So the first thing to say is we are still expanding our network of trusted partners. So trusted partners can continue to join the scheme. And I mentioned Cambridge at Acre um, joining recently as part of our work with the Warm Hubs, uh, and, and we welcome new trusted partners on board. Um, 
there is a list of trusted partners, which of course I can circulate to members. There is also a list on our website. So there are two, there aren't two, there's not a hierarchy, but some trusted partners are happy to be public facing and that list is on our website. Other trusted partners don't necessarily want direct referrals. They are working in their own way with their own client groups and have different referral groups. So I will happily circulate the full list, but members should be aware that there are some of the trusted partners who don't necessarily want their services publicized in that way. Um, I hope that explains it. Sorry, that wasn't very clear. Um, in terms of the warm hubs, there is no direct money coming to the county council for warm hubs. Um, certainly in the in South Cambridgeshire, East Cambridgeshire and Cambridge City, uh, the warm hubs there are being funded by uh, NHS money, their local NHS and the integrated care system. Um, each district um, is taking a different approach to warm hubs. Um, South and East Cambridge, as I mentioned, have commissioned Cambridge Eureka, who are running warm hubs for them. Cambridge City are taking a slightly different approach and using uh, community buildings that they already have some degree of control over. Uh, Huntingdonshire District Council um, are effectively putting together a list of places that are already open and, and, and act as warm hubs and are, are reminding people. So the slightly different approach in each area, I think a member briefing was produced and I'd need to check that, that it went out, but I think we sent a member briefing out on, on the different approaches in the different districts. Um, and we are effectively just trying to marble our household support offer around whatever's already there and to say, okay, how can we engage with the people who are coming in uh, and, and make sure the offer is put in front of them. Uh, the only, dis uh, in terms of the county council's approach, we are reminding people that libraries uh, are a place where you will receive a warm welcome. Um, there is an issue about warm hubs. Not everyone loves the phrase, and there's a discussion that, that, that can be stigmatizing. Um, and I think we've got a unique place with libraries in that people are used to going to them for all sorts of reasons, which could include warmth. And so we've taken the decision at the moment not to label them warm hubs, um, because it's a, it's a complementary uh, set of places where people can go, where you don't necessarily have the stigma of walking through a door and saying, I'm here because I can't afford to turn the heating on. Um, my my researcher tells me that it was sent on the 14th of October. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Ros, you're next. Um, two questions. One is about, um, on page 22, 2.5.3, it's the table, um, and I don't understand, well, there's two tables. One is table one, gross annual income, and one is table two, net income per week. And for a couple with three children, the gross annual income must not exceed 45,548. And on table two, the net income per week must not exceed for the same family, 988. And that just strikes me that the second one is wildly different from the first one. Yeah, what's happened? And then I've got a second question afterwards, but I'm happy, yeah. I, I'm smiling because that's extraordinarily well spotted. It took us ages to spot it's wildly different. Um, and I, I do have the answer. So. And in fact, I thank you for the reminder, these have, have since been updated anyway and, and have, 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 rise, have risen um, based on inflationary uplifts um, since since we did the paper. Um, but because we're asking for the principle of agreeing, not the individual amounts. The answer is the weekly income accounts for both pre-tax earnings and any benefits that might be coming into the... Um, so such as cost of living payments, child benefit, council tax support, universal credit, are pushed into the weekly in net weekly income, whereas the gross income is just the gross income and doesn't account for all of those. Uh, and, and we believe that that's because that's the way people look at their, if you're paid annually, that's what you get. If you're paid weekly, you will take that into account. So yeah, thank you for that clarity. You know, if you, if you multiply um, some of the uh, nets by 52, you end up with more than the gross without question. Well, thank you for that. And, and then the second question was, um, so that I know the hub offer is supposed to provide, is there to provide, you know, support and advice and guidance to people where to go. Um, are, we in, are we able to really help everyone who's really, really struggling? Are we finding that even with all that, there are still people who are really struggling? How, you know, what does it kind of look and feel like? 
I, I think that's a really interesting question. There are some people who frankly don't want to engage um, and that we've had that back from Household Support Fund One when we knew that only 40% of the people bothered to open or you know, um, the pack that at the time we gave them an information pack rather than the, the, the personalized support. So some people will still not want to engage. Um, will we change everyone's life that comes through the hub? No. Um, will we be able to, um, but what we can do is try and get under the skin of why they are in a position where they're having to apply for um, financial support and see what else can be done. Um, if they are, frankly, if they're on every benefit, there's some things that almost no one knows about, a little bit more awareness now, but social broadband tariffs, for example, are incredibly underutilized. Um, healthy start vouchers are incredibly underutilized. There's still a lot of Uni almost near universal benefits available. Uh, they're not universal, but if, with the eligible criteria uh, that are not taken up. So we we do believe we can make a significant difference to a significant amount of people. I'm not going to sit here and claim it's going to be everyone now. There will be people who who whatever we do, they're still struggling for whatever reason. And what we don't do a lot of is um, is budgeting. I mean, there might be other areas in terms of financial literacy that we're talking to skills colleagues at the moment about, because you can maximise someone's income if their expenditure exceeds it. Uh, I'm getting into Dickensian territory, aren't I? Uh, uh, you know where I am. Yeah. Roswell, well spotted as well. Um, Bryony, Lucy, and then Doug. Sorry, I don't mean to hijack with, with a, a warm hub question again. Um, with the briefing, it mentioned that Fenland was still considering their approach. Is it an update that you have on this, or can you send us one outside of this meeting, if possible? I'll update outside the meeting, if I may. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid this is also a warm hubs question, and I'm very sorry. Um, it, it comes back to the point that was made about libraries, and I think your point about libraries being um, a, a stigma-free place that we would absolutely want to encourage. I mean, we want to encourage people to use our libraries um, all the time, regardless of the weather, uh, but they are a place where um, people are extremely welcome to go and spend time at any time. Um, I just wondered whether we will be monitoring use of them kind of any more energetically this winter just to see what, whether the level of need is up and whether there are people who are particularly um, coming in for reasons, a different group of people who are coming in um, and also whether we will be having stuff in the libraries um, making it clear that the household support fund is there because I think that there may be people who 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 come into our libraries this winter um who who wouldn't otherwise come into contact with our services um and also with advice about um energy saving things in the home which which are increasingly around but but libraries would seem a very good place to, for us to be trying to get that message out sorry there are more questions about libraries than about this paper and apologies for that <laughs> That's okay. Thank you, Kesla. Um, the honest answer is it's not a discussion we've had about monitoring use, and I'll take that away because I think it's a perfectly reasonable question. Um, in terms of our engagement, again, I mean, the, the answer is broadly the same as the Warm Hubs one. If we, It's a, a contact point, an opportunity when people are coming in. Um, it was just, a, I'm told, a very successful um, event at Ely Library last week around um, cost of living event, and we did send out uh, members of our anti-poverty team to try and engage with people uh, on the doorstep, so to speak. In the, um, and there was a similar pop-up in Cambridge City, not in the library, but we are trying to learn from that kind of outreach approach. So we have to have a direct application scheme of people come to us. And the first three, uh, as I said, so this is iterative and we are learning. And I think we are getting very close uh, in terms of how we draw people in and we but how do we go out and, and engage and i think that's part of that so uh we have a, a meeting next week about how we learn from those first two events and what we might put into place in a more systematic basis and structured basis thank you all doug you're next thank you chairman um, um apologies i'm not going to talk about the warm hubs i'm going to talk about the household support fund um I think it's excellent that we're still, you know, able to do this. I have a couple of concerns 
around the fact that uh, we're only getting the same funding that we originally had. I realise in tranche one, we had difficulties necessarily shifting it, which could cause different problems. My concern now is that we've got the fund, which we've opened to a wider group of people. We've increased it by 10% per applicant. Um, and it's really the question of, of the risk involved, as you, as you alluded to, Paul, you know, we want to make sure we don't run out of money. It's really around the management that we do of monitoring the groups that we've um, given authority to effectively distribute this to make sure that we don't run into a wall without knowing about it. I'm sure we're not, but just to like to know about the management and the, and the, the risk that you identified behind that to make sure that, number one, everyone who should be there is, is, is fairly dealt with and fairness is the thing at the end of the day and also that we you know we make sure that the funds are there for the for the year if possible so uh, i won't go any further than that so if you could elucidate me that'd be great thank you uh, happily thank you i mean what one of the many reasons for trying to move towards a standard rate of all applicants is it makes it a lot easier to calculate um because there is a queue i mean we we, we aim to um get things processed in a few days, but at certain very busy periods, a queue will develop and we need to be able to understand what the queue will cost us, to be very blunt about it. And moving towards a standard rate really does allow us to do that uh, a lot more. So there are still some people in the age UK queue from the previous uh, trans of HSF, which we are allowed to pay from the, the previous uh, allocation because they applied in advance, uh, in advance of the deadline. So we know how much that was going to cost because we could calculate it on a standard rate. Um, Demand-led schemes are always difficult to predict. We just we just don't know. So we we average. Uh, we we do look. Uh, we have management information where we look at applications per day. Um, we are expecting peaks in January and February based on last year. So we're we're bringing that in. But there is no guarantee that we won't have to come back at some point and say, well, we need to put some restrictions on the scheme or it will run out because they are demand led. And so our only option is to, to if, if, if the demand is greater than the, our ability to pay, we have to try and find something to, to bring that demand down somewhat, which is a difficult position, but we have a cash limit. Professor Rodbun, thank you for that. Um, Paul, just looking at recommendation, C, where it says allow a further application to the fund from those who have previously received support. So that's people that have received support under the two previous tranches. I assume that's what we're referring to. That's right. Yeah. And I think after in the first tranche, we said to people, you could only apply once into the fund because we were concerned about the funding running out, as, as Doug's highlighted. Yeah. But under this new one, we're saying if you've had support before, you can still still apply. That's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? That's all. No. Okay. So there seems to be a consensus in support of um, those recommendations A to D. Um, so if anybody disagrees, do you want to raise your hand now? But uh, no, that's good. Um, so excellent. So um, we'll take those as carried unanimously. Thank you for your your contributions to that um, that scheme. And well done to everybody. Um, behind it. It's, it's really helping a lot of people. So item five is the coroner service mortuary facilities um, contract. This is also a key decision and will be presented by the assistant director of regulatory services, Peter Gell. Thank you, Peter. Good morning, everybody. So say hello to Rachel as well. I was going to say it's actually me. I'm not, I'm, my name's Rachel. Peter's going to do the next bit. So, um, Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Rachel Lovelidge, and I'm the business manager for the Coroner Service. And I'm here uh, joined by Sarah Abbott, who's just sat behind me, and also Peter Joe, who's the Assistant Director for the Regulatory Services. So this morning, I'm here to ask for your approval to begin the procurement process for the mortuary provisions for the north of, of the jurisdiction. Um, and I understand that my proposal has already been circulated to the committee members. So I'm not going to read it out word for word, but did just want to highlight a few areas to you. So one of the statutory obligations of the coroner is to, deter to determine the cause of death. And sometimes a post-mortem examination is required in order to establish this. There are currently two contracts that are in place, one in the north of the jurisdiction, and this is held by Northwest Anglia NHS Foundation Trust, and then in the south of the jurisdiction, by Cambridge University Hospital or Adam Brooks, as we probably know it as. So the current contract with North West Anglia NHS Foundation Trust expires in March 2023. So this is why this new proc 
procurement process is required. So from April 2023, the new contract will provide, um, will continue to provide, sorry, body storage, post-mortem facilities, and also hospital staffing. And I'm sure you can imagine this is a very, very limited market. Um, and there's not one provider that's able to cover the entire jurisdiction. And this is mainly down to the size of the facilities and also the staff provisions. Um, and you may remember that last year, we worked closely with the transformation team to, to review this contract and to bring in this contract in-house in order to save money. But it was concluded that this isn't financially viable and it wouldn't be financially viable for us to build our own mortuary. There is also at the moment a shortage of pathologists, and this has also been noted by the chief coroner in his annual report. This again would have implications if we were to build our own mortuary. And we do of course continue to review upcoming contracts by working closely with the procurement team and also Pathfinder Law. So I've kind of highlighted to you the main part of the, um, the, the paper. I just wondered if you had any, had any questions. Thank you very much, Rachel. Any questions from members at all on this? Yep, well, one for you. Oh, well covered, yes, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Philippa? Thank you, and again, apologies for being disruptive. Um, as reading this, um, as you know, whenever I've been in Addenbrooke and you go along the basement, you sort of assume that mortuaries are with health hospitals. Do we have um, any or many mortuaries outside of that system? Um, do we even have sort of specialists coming in for particular use, uses? Do, do you mean um, other mortuaries in the area? Mm, yeah. so we, we've only got um, Adam Brooks and we've got um, MWAF. If we do need any provision for, for children, for example, for post-mortem, we do send them to Great Ormond Street um, or, or Leicester, one infirmary is another place mm. that we might use. But those two do cover the majority of the, the our requirements, apart from for children. So we're not essentially putting it out to tender as much will, as reviewing the contract that already exists and expecting it to be with the same people. We are putting it out for tender to review the contract, mm. um, but we expect it to be a very, a very small response. Right. Um, and the other question I did, if I may, on a, quite another subject, um, being aware um, and the, you're, it's come up a little bit in, in the right at the end of your, your report, being aware of different cultural interests and, and um, practices and wishes in terms of the speed with which we can um, uh, help somebody, you know, deal with a family member who's dead. Essentially, you never know quite what language to use, but essentially some people, it's really important to them for their speed. For other people, it's not quite so important. Um, have we have your staff had to deal with many sort of distressing backlogs in that way? Is are there ways in which we can um, take take particular care of particular people? That might mean a certain discrimination, even. But in a good cause, I just wondered whether you find yourself in that situation. Yes, yeah, if, if I may. So I think there's, there's two areas there. So, so one is if so I think this is death at a, a weekend. So in, in those scenarios, we are very receptive to being able to resolve those quickly and the coroner will pick up and be able to, to help families and, and of, of those deceased be able to guess matters quickly. Uh, I th think the other area is where you, there is a uh, an investigation required because of the nature of uh, what, what has happened and some answered questions that rely further investigations. Uh, in those cases, obviously we'll try and progress things as soon as possible, but they do, uh, inevitably rely on pathologists it may well rely on expert witnesses and then we're really reliant upon how quickly they are available and there is a a general challenge at the moment with some of the medical witnesses that we and others would, would want to use because of the backlog in the nhs system as you can imagine so there's a huge amount of demand at, at the moment so i think we are very sensitive i think is the way i would uh, describe it to that and we will uh, help where where we can but but certainly uh, there's, there's quite a, f a few deaths where matters can be resolved quite quickly and those very much prioritised and you know it doesn't matter whether that's a Saturday or Sunday night you know the staff still respond to those. Okay thank you Jan you're next. Thank you um, I'd like to ask two questions one uh, 2.5 and also 3.3 um, does the uh, uh, always within three working days of permission to proceed having are you still on time within the three three working days? 
in most of the cases, we are on time within three working days. A lot of it comes down to the availability of pathologists within the mm. hospital. Now, obviously, you're extremely stretched, but um, uh, well done if you managed to do that. And 3.3, uh, county insurance individual cases can be dealt with within a timely manner. So basically, it's the same, more or less the same question as 2.5. I mean, obviously, you're all struggling. Yeah, I think that's the same. We do we do aim to do them within three working days, yeah. Okay, any, anything else, Jan? That's it. Okay, thank you. Anybody else wish to comment or ask questions? Okay, that's good. I see no objections. Um, so we'll take the recommendations as carried unanimously. Thank you very much, both, both of you, Rachel and, and Peter. Item six, um, we were going to consider um, at this point um, the annual report of the coroner service, but I'm proposing that we first consider the business planning proposals, which is the subsequent item on the agenda. Does any, any member have an objection to that at all? Happy that we take the business proposals first. So that report will be presented by Paul um, Fox again and the senior finance business partner, Claire Andrews, um, who's also here to Ask any questions. Hi, Claire. Thank you very much. Paul. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a, a paper regarding uh, our business planning proposals for the financial years 2023 to 2028. Um, and sections one to three uh, in this report are common to all committees. They set out the process of the business planning uh, and the financial strategy set out the context in which financial context in which the council operates sets out the financial challenge in terms of the budget gaps set out at 1.3 uh, and reminds members that there's a legal requirement to set a balanced budget and sets out the kind of pressures and the, the headwinds that the council is facing and that have contributed towards the financial challenge in the gap set out at 1.3 cosmic specific elements of the report I'm going to talk to in the main, um, which are at section four. So section 4.2 reminds committee that it has a responsibility for a range of services that post uh, senior management reorganization now sit across two council directorates, uh, strategy and partnerships and place and sustainability and 4.21 and 4.22 set out those services. Uh, so within think communities within strategy and partnerships we have think communities and anti-poverty services library skills archives and the anti-poverty hub uh, in place and sustainability um, cosmic has responsibility for registration citizenship coroners trading standards domestic abuse and sexual violence services this report addresses the totality of those services at 4.2 4.4 sets out, uh, or the, the subsequent paragraph set out a combination of um, issues that will have a cumulative impact on the services um, that are under the auspices of COSMIC and therefore this budget paper. And I just wanted to mention, highlight those one by one, if I may. So the first is uh, unmet legacy savings targets. Um, over a period of two years, uh, recurrent savings and incomes targets were levied on a small bundle of services uh, in a previous structure that comprised the skills service, the regulatory services and domestic abuse and community services. And from just those three services, targets and income targets and savings were set for £650,000 and they were met non-recurrently um, last year and have been met non-recurrently this year. And that is quite a challenge. We have been able to address half a million pounds of those targets, but there are still 150,000 pounds of legacy savings for that group of services that we've been unable to identify and certainly unable to identify within the scope of 4.3.3 that those, those legacy savings targets should not lead to a reduction in service levels. 4.5 talks about the issue relating to the Think Communities team. The Think Community Service is funded through a combination of core budgets and non-recurrent investment, uh, which is being reversed out uh, next year. And indicative, and I, I, when I say Think Communities, I do include the Youth and Community Service here. Um, the 
budget available for those uh, services from core budgets is around 376,000, uh, but we had an original service model cost of 340,000, a revenue gap challenge of 563,000 pounds. Uh, I can update members, we have sticked at the final um, sentence there says offices are examining whether the integration of these services uh, can offer opportunities to help meet the funding gap. That funding gap, uh, we have now brought down to 234,000 um, based on the structure and efficiency opportunities uh, we believe we can achieve through closer integration, structural integration of the think communities and youth in communities teams, which currently run separately. Um, that gap now, 234 to reiterate that, that amount, and we will continue to look at that. Um, but as I say, we, are, we now have a uh, wider communities and partnership service, which includes services not under the remit of COSMIC, uh, under Sue Grace's Executive Director of Strategy and Partnerships, and that may provide more opportunities um, to try and address that funding gap in what is a, we perceive to be a key service to deliver uh, our aims of localism and decentralization. Uh, and uh, community engagement. There is also a non-staff element to the Think Communities budget that has been reversed out that includes the Cultivate Cambridgeshire Fund. Um, we've talked to, uh, in a previous paper about the Household Support Fund. Our anti-poverty hub um, delivers the Household Support Fund as we've discussed, but also, and arguably as importantly, if not more importantly, um, the wider offer, that wider wraparound offer that uh, I spoke about that aims people to get on a more even keel and a longer term basis. Uh, the current staffing model is costed at £583,000, Um Now there is an issue here about not knowing whether the Household Support Fund will continue. If it continues next year, um, the, the funding gap problem to some extent disappears um, because a reasonable 10% allocation of the 3.58 million uh, would provide a £358,000 uh, administrative cost uh, budget uh, for each six month period. So a full year effect of 716, and that would actually cover the staff for the anti-poverty hub. Of course, uh, we can't plan on hope. Uh, and therefore at the moment, we're representing that as a, a, a budget gap of 583,000. And there is also a non-staff budget related to the operation of the hub as well, that's been funded in year um, by strategy and resources. Uh, elements relating to libraries at 4.9, um, some pressures based on new developments in South Cambridgeshire. Um, but also, I just wanted to update members again, since this paper has been written, um, we have um, found the money to continue the business intellectual property centres. Um, so those are no longer under threat. Um, 4.10. There's an element of pressures in the coroner's service. This year's budget contained additional investment to help deal with the backlog of cases due to the pandemic, uh, but they have been outstripped by increasing pathology costs. Um, further procurement exercises coming up in 23-24 will result in additional costs as well as um, providers increase their prices based on inflation and the need to pay staff and cost of living, cost of fuel, etc. Um, so that's a challenge given that uh, there is a removing money from that the one off uh, investment from the budget. Uh, there's also an element of capital so some of these capital schemes we will provide more information on all of the above and the capital schemes at the December committee. Um, but there are the capital expenditure at 5.1 is not new that has already been allocated and there's also um, a reference at 5.4.3 to the community's capital fund. Again, not new resource uh, that remains, that relates to the unallocated um, element uh, where projects have not continued and resources have been returned to the pot. That's currently about 700,000 pounds. Six sets out the timetable. Um, and as I say, apologies that this is such a work in progress, but hopefully you can see uh, that we have had a, a number of challenges that are sort of unique compared to some of the other committees. Our scope and our focus has been trying not to uh, let the budget grab, go larger um, because of these pressures, rather than being able to identify savings, which may be the focus of many of the other committees. Uh, of course, we are looking for savings. Of course, we are looking for efficiencies. Um, but given our starting position, 
that savings inefficiencies are going to keeping the gap down or reducing the gap rather than contributing to the, the wider savings target. Okay, thank you very much. Any comments, questions, Hilary? Thank you. Um, yeah, actually, just before going specifically onto the Cosmic Report, and thank you so much for that, Paul, um, I just wanted to make a couple of points about the introduction, um, the overview, which, as you pointed out, is across the council. So I just wanted to mention something on uh, 1.6, where we talk about inflation impacting the budget and um, saying it's the cause of bottlenecks in demand following COVID and the outbreak of the war in Ukraine. And I think that actually, if we're going to start listing reasons, we could get into a big debate around climate change and crop failure and energy insecurity and Brexit and six week prime ministers, TOFU eating, Bank of England. So actually, I think that um, I don't think that we should start list anything there to ensure that it remains uh, non-partisan. That is my thought there. And then I had a question uh, from on 1.8, please, Paul, where um, we said staffing is one of our highest costs and the need to pay staff a fair wage. I just wondered if um, we could clarify what fair wage means, please. Thank you, Councillor, of course. Um, so yes, as you say, staffing is one of the council's highest costs, as, as you might expect, um, and we do have a commitment to fair wages. Um, the That reference um, reflects the fact that our staff will be facing their own inflationary impacts, and therefore the inflationary impact on our staff costs will be higher uh, than previously, and that allows us to recruit and retain employees as a direct cost to the council. Um, includes our commitment to the fair wage as well. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my internet's dropped out just at the wrong time, so I, I shall do my best without the agenda paper in front of me now. Um, uh, yes, I have real concerns around the value attributed to and the sustainability of the Think Communities staff, uh, Cultivate Cambridgeshire, uh, the Community Engagement Vehicle, uh, and those who are highlighted at 4.5 and 4.6. Um, it also says earlier in the paper, 1.12, that decentralisation re will rely on savings being made before we can deliver that. But those two different elements are intrinsically linked. And, and I have to say, the lack of savings from decentralisation is self-inflicted by the joint administration because two years ago, we had a plan ready to go the Think Communities team was designed and set up to deliver decentralisation, as was the Community Engagement Vehicle and earlier Cultivate Cambridge Fund under a different name. So they were all set up to deliver decentralisation. Uh, and when the Joint Administration took over, they scrapped those plans. But of course, the structure around that still remains. Now, had we undertook decentralisation, we would have the benefits of the savings of that partnership working in a place-based way so that that wouldn't be a question mark now because we would already be working in a decentralized way more more efficiently and those savings would be being made so we're now in a in a vicious circle of saying we're struggling to afford the team that delivers decentralization yet we know decentralization is one of the ways that we will save money and deliver better services so um my, my question, and, and this was a political decision, Chairman, so it's it's to you more than Paul, really. What is the plan? Because we've waited 18 months for a decentralisation plan. Now there's a question mark over its deliverability, yet we have all the team in place that we're having to pay for that was designed to deliver that plan. So uh, uh, politically, where is the joint administration going with this? Because, um, you, you know, it is unsustainable if we don't deliver decentralisation then there is a whole question mark around the structure and the staffing that we've set up to do that. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. Um, you'll see from our agenda plan later in, uh, on that we um, will be discussing decentralization at our meeting on the 8th of December. So the papers for that will be coming out um, shortly. To your point about costs going up, um, inflation has, as we all know, spiraled out of control. Um, those inflationary pressures will, are hitting and hurting us considerably. 
um, and that is one of the factors behind it. Also, I'd point out that I think Communities team um, did need to deliver the Communities Capital Fund, and they weren't really designed to do that, and that has taken up a lot of time. Um, and I'm not sure it's something that we can deliver again, given the state of our, our budget and the economy. So there will be some very tough decisions to make. I don't quite share your optimism that um, that would have, as you said, solved a lot of our problems and, and made all those savings. So we are in a very tough position. Everyone knows that um, in the last sort of 18 months, two years have really exacerbated that. Um, but there will be a lot of debate at our meeting on the 8th of December. So I look forward to, to discussing further then, Lucy. Thank you. Um, I thought it might be worth my responding to Steve's points as well. Um, uh, the first thing I want to say is that it feels to me as if there's a little bit of rewriting history in, in what Steve has said, and I'm sorry to challenge you on that. Um, but I don't feel as if there was a big programme of decentralisation that the um, joint administration stopped. That's not my reading of what's happened over the last couple of years in any way. Um, we have actually continued with the Think Communities teams and they've done an enormous amount of work over the last couple of years. The situation that we inherited was that the funding for those teams was not in the base budget. It was short term funding. Um, we found the funding for that for last year. Um, but given the um, extraordinary pressures that there are on our budget this year, um, we are having to look at the structure of those teams, um, not because we are wanting to stop the work that they're doing, but because it's necessary to make sure that there is long term stability and that they're not constantly funded by one year funding because actually that's not a good way of running a service um, and I know that Paul and Sue are working extremely hard looking at how we can make sure that that work continues um, but not based on one year funding based on a long-term and sustainable um, staffing structure um, so I'm very supportive of the work that they're doing on that and I think that this is incredibly important on the decentralization point um, actually I think you have a point. Um, I wish very much that we had made more progress on that than we have done. Um, it is, it, it's not going as quickly as I would ideally like. We will have a paper coming back in November. Um, but in order to do it well, we need to do it with our partners. And, um, and, and part of the um, reason that it's not going as quickly as we would like is that we are working with a bunch of um, councils who are all under extreme pressure and who are all looking at their budgets and feeling extremely worried about what the next few years are going to bring. Um, and we need to make sure that um, we are working together to make sure that we're getting the maximum um, impact across the whole county. Um, and we will continue to do that. I wish it was going faster, but um, it, it needs to be done properly. And we're trying to make sure that that's happening. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Lucy. Anybody else? Um, Claire. Yes, thank you. Um, there's no separate mention of archives, the archive service here. Is that um, included just under the general umbrella of the libraries or are there any particular cost pressures or savings um, for the archive service? There are, is included under the general library's budget. We are looking at the archive service and looking at some benchmarking data to see um, where we are. Uh, the archive service have uh, striven to increase their income through um, uh, partnerships with genealogy companies, online companies and things like that, allowing access to the archives so that they're doing their, their part. But uh, benchmarking data might suggest that we are um, nearer the uh, higher end of cost for archive services. So we're going to be having a look at that in more detail. Thank you. Um, could I just ask then in future if a mention could be made of the archives, it is a separate service. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry, Steve, I didn't let you come back. The floor's yours. Thank you, Chairman. And sorry to labour the point. I just wanted to reassure Councillor Nessinger, we did actually have a plan. We had 22 um, locality areas identified. They've been consulted on with town and parish councils, districts and health, based loosely on primary care networks, and they were all ready to go last May. So that would have been decentralisation happening at the time. So just to reassure you on that point, Chairman, thank you. I just wanted to ask you to ask, well, if this is in order, to ask you a question, Steve. You said in your introductory remarks you didn't agree with the value in 
I think referring to the Think Communities team, the um, vehicle, I think something else you met. Could, could you just clarify what you meant on, on that? The paper seems to questionise the sustain, question the sustainability and value of those of those items. I value them very highly. I was instrumental in introducing them. I'm just saying now the paper highlights that they're under threat or we don't know how we're going to fund them uh, when they're actually there to deliver decentralisation. So that was my point, Chairman. I'm not questioning the value of them. I'm I'm just concerned that the paper does. I'm not sure the paper. But that was what the paper was saying. I can see perhaps your interpretation on that. I think we do value them very highly, and um, no doubt we'll have a further debate on the uh, the eighth of December. Um, as, as Lucy said, of course, they are on soft money at the moment. They're not non-recurrent non funding, I think is the phrase. So there is something that we need to um, we do need to focus on. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, certainly, Paul. Just just on a point of explanation on the community engagement vehicle, without adding any subjectivity to it, um, it is our belief that it's approaching the end of its natural life. So that's not just an issue regarding. Um, um, the availability of the resource to run it. Uh, it was a repurposed library vehicle, I believe. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just, my understanding is it's come to the end of its its time. Okay, thank you. Anybody else on business planning at all? No? Okay, so thank you very much, Paul, for your um, presentation. We've got the rec recommendations at A to C. Um, now I'm gonna, chance my arm here by saying there seems to be a consensus on the recommendations if I got that correct are we happy to um to carry those recommendations anybody have any objections okay those are carried unanimously thank you very much so we'll go back to um the Cambridge and Peterborough Coroner Service annual report and Rachel you're going to present along with Peter thank you Thank you, Chair. So yes, we have the, the annual report again. A number of you will have seen this in the past. So this, the format is pretty similar. Uh, some areas to just highlight for you. I think previously we talked very much around some of the staffing challenges we've had, certainly around our coronial appointments. And also we've, we've addressed that uh, over the past sort of eight, 18 months, uh, as far as getting sufficient coronial uh, resource. We have had sort of challenges, what about only internal staffing to support those. Uh, again, it's one of those areas we've, we've got a number across the dollar, across the dollar, where it is difficult to recruit. There aren't necessarily people coming in uh, through those professions. And what we're having to do is to recruit those with skills uh, that are complementary that we can then train up in sort of the coronial legislation. Uh, so that is what we've been doing. We've also had some uh, long term sickness uh, that we've had to, to, to deal with. So if, it's only really now we're getting a situation where we've got a full uh, establishment in order to, to drive that that service forward. I think the, the pandemic as well has had a, an impact, you know, with numbers of staff having time off uh, through, through illness. Fortunately, no transmission during the workplace, but obviously transmission out, outside of that has had an impact on some of the, the, the staffing. So I think the story is we're in a very much better place now than we have been uh, as far as having the teams in place. And therefore, the the support around those those staffs. Certainly, when you've got new staff, ensuring we've got this sort of training development, uh, we're giving them the, the skills, the knowledge, and the expertise required uh, to take that service forward. And that's very much uh, a focus of the team. And also using the technology available to us. Uh, so, like many services, we rely on back office systems, and often we use only a proportion of the capability of those systems. But obviously, there's more that can be gained. Uh, often with that and we've been very much looking at that and the system that that, that team uses and benchmarking how other uh, local authorities and coronal services are actually using the same same systems and obviously there's a lot to be gained from that and we found out found that really useful uh, and have been recently changing some of the processes that we've got again to make ourselves more efficient and been able to, to manage sort of the caseloads that we have. As a service, we have quite a lot of links with a whole range of partners, and a number of those are sort of detailed uh, within the re report itself. Real uh, success with some of the working with the police recently on on some of the referrals that we get from them, ensuring that the quality of information that we receive very much helps us uh, progress matters as quickly as possible. Uh, in the in the past, it's been a bit of a mixed picture, and I think what we've been able to do through working with them is develop sort of templates and things that enable 
uh, systems to very much uh, provide us with the, the key information that we need in a simple sort of streamlined manner. And that's one of the successes this year. We touched on uh, technology, talking about back over systems, but also it's been really important as far as the way we conduct uh, sort of in inquests. And it's something which, again, we reported on previously around the investment that we had largely through some of the funding available during the, the, the pandemic to enable uh, inquests to be to carry out remotely. And that's been a real success and continues to be so with uh, some of our expert witnesses, uh, a number of which in the, in the past have had to fly in from abroad in order to appear in an inquest. Now, the ability, you can imagine when we talked earlier about the, the pressures in the NHS, now some of those experts to be able to dial in remotely now very much saves them the uh, time uh, and reduces some of the pressure on them. There is there's still a struggle with their time, but that, that's certainly one of these things that has helped. What we tend to see now is most of the, the expert witnesses dialing in, uh, more of the families tend to want to actually go to, to the inquest, but that option is available to them. And I think that, as far as accessibility, has been a real enhancement for the service. And again, we've had the support of our sort of our IT colleagues and enable us to, to take that forward. Venues is one of the, the topics that we've, we've talked about a number of times uh, in, the, in the past. We've had challenges around uh, sufficient facilities to hold inquests. Well, actually, we are in a good position uh, in that respect at the moment. Obviously, we've got this fantastic facility here that we use. We've, we've got space in Lawrence Court and we've got access to the town hall in Peterborough. And using those combination of facilities has enabled us to make significant savings as detailed in the reports on external venue hire. And that's something which is really crucial at the moment. So we can't see us having to use any external venues unless uh, we're really, really struggling and need to run uh, multiple inquests at a time. But if that will be an absolute last resort, we're very conscious of keeping uh, the costs, costs down. And I think through careful management of coroners, uh, inquests and the venues, uh, certainly we've made some real strides in, in that sense. Uh, we were given uh, an opportunity with, we thought with the local court here again, unfortunately that disappeared quite quickly. We, were, we made some bookings there for time and then things came into the court system and they asked us to cancel last minute. And, and obviously for those uh, that very much rely on our service, they need consistency. So rather than you know, messing sort of families around and, and saying actually we had to cancel and move arrangements again, we decided it's better to keep control of cells and, and use those facilities that we have access to as, as a council within our own facilities. And that's worked out well. I think going forward ideally we'd be looking at a better office location than, than Lawrence Court it's a, it's a listed building it wasn't designed for a, a modern modern service it hasn't got to the facilities that we've got here uh, in, the, in this in this building uh, but we do know because of the again post pandemic as, as a council quite rightly we review our own sort of portfolio and our usage across across the piece and, and, and Tony Cooper as, as far as he when he looks at needs across services will also consider is there anything better that is available that may suit the coroner's service going forward? So we have a, a location that we can work from. Let's say we've got the inquests covered as far as venues at the moment, but should there be a better office space to work from in the future, then hopefully that's something that may come about from potentially repurposing uh, council buildings. But it's, it's something it's, I would say is not, not urgent, but would be a vision for the service going forward. So just commenting on on performance, the, the pandemic has had a, an impact on us as, as it has all jurisdictions in extending uh, the backlog of cases. There were periods when we weren't able to, to operate at all, or periods where we're having to operate in a reduced manner. What we have done, though, is very much focus on the oldest cases that, that we had and, and trying to re remove those. And we made significant headway in the very, uh, as I say, those, those uh, oldest cases beyond 12 months. What I think is probably quite in, interesting for you is in, under 2.5.6 with some details in relation to the breakdown that we have to give nationally as part, as part of our performance returns. And, and that's, uh, these are the headings that we have, we have to use. So, so effectively, uh, these give some explanation of what some of those cases over 12 months, what the delay is. Uh, so you, you see 46.8% are actually delayed because we're waiting on expert specialist reports. So these are reports that are absolutely necessary for coroner to determine or come to a conclusion in relation to the, uh, the matter before them. In some cases, you will get uh, expert reports that identify further issues that prompt further reports from other experts. So notably, it doesn't mean having got one report that answers all the, all the questions. Uh, 
one way I sometimes look at this is if it was a criminal investigation, somebody's gone to the police with a suspicion of a crime, the investigation then starts and that can take many months. And that's very much the same in some respects with the coroner's service. You know, there's a suspicious death and then the investigation at that point starts and the, and the team working with the coroner undertake the necessary investigations and seek the expert witnesses in order to, to help them uh, try and identify so the, the cause. Also a number of uh, inquests that are delayed through uh, having to be suspended because of the involvement in criminal matters and obviously they will take precedent and will take place first and then, then this matter resumes post, post those. So I think that's probably just helpful to see uh, some of the breakdown. But I would like to do just give this committee reassurance though that that is our single biggest uh, focus and priority as, as a service is to do what we can to reduce the, the any waiting time for those uh, friends and family of the deceased in order, in order to enable them to bring closure as, as soon as possible and, and hence everything we're doing around systems, uh, staffing processes to try and uh, address that. Okay, thank you, Peter. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Claire. Um, yeah, thank you. I've got a couple of questions, please. Um, at one point four, you mentioned um, the rather unusual situation that um, the Cambridge and Peterborough jurisdiction is in with the four main hospitals, and I think it's yeah three prisons. So um, obviously that brings lots of challenges, but does it also bring in extra resources? Is there are there extra resources from the NHS and from the Home Office? Um very good question, but unfortunately not. It brings the, the challenge, but not the, not the resources to support it. It is one of that one of those <clears throat> excuse me areas that I know is being raised with the chief coroner. So the association of uh, ch uh, chief executives for the county councils has raised some concern in relation to the the way the coronial services themselves are funded, because the the burden very much falls on the, the local authority. And if as we are an authority where we have a higher proportion of uh, complex cases, then you know, it's the council at the moment that picks up that, that burden. Uh, there is a, a, you know, a thought as to whether the funding as a service should be a nationally funded service, whether actually there should be an opportunity for local authorities that feel particular hardship to be able to make a case for some additional funding from government. And, and what I'm hopeful actually is that there will be a meeting following uh, you know, the approach from the Chief Exec Group for a meeting with the Chief Coroner and opportunities but, perhaps to raise that with, with government for potential additional funding in the, in the future, because yes, this is one of those pressures at a time actually, as, as we know, across the organisation, it is a very you know, challenging financial situation. And what we're seeing at the moment, and it, we've picked up on that area, is some of the contracts are coming through, costing us more, and actually some of those legitimately we should be seeking if we can to get additional funding to help. But at the moment, the burden falls on ourselves. Thank, thanks very much for that explanation. So my next question concerns uh, the families um, of those people who, are, where the coroner's um, work, where the coroner's service is needed. Um, do the families receive um, support for travel to inquest? And do they also receive um, pastoral support when there is a delay, who's looking after the people who are suffering because of the delay? Yeah, there is support uh, provide, and, and referrals to, to, to a system. We have uh, people at, at court again to assist them through, through that, that process. As far as the, the cost, I'm probably going to turn around and just look at one of my colleagues because they will know. Sorry, my name is Sarah Hamilton. and I'm the investigations manager for the service. Um, I'm sorry. We don't provide any financial support to families to travel to inquest, but what we do do is to liaise with them around what the best venue for them is. So we will always try and um, accommodate them, what's most convenient for them and how they would like to attend and in what capacity as well. And I suppose just, just to add to that, the fact that now they can dial in remotely for those that have the capability, that again makes these more accessible for some than it otherwise would, would have been. So I suppose the services that we offer, I would say, would be consistent with that of other local authorities, other than we've probably gone down the technology route more than some would have done at this point. 
Thanks very much. Um, could you perhaps deal with my question concerning the pastoral support? Because if there are long delays, it must be very distressing for families. It, it, it can be. Um, so one of the things that we have on each inquest is a dedicated coroner's officer. Um, and one of the things that we're working on developing far more than we have done historically is regular contact and updates. Even if that update is just to say there hasn't been any movement, we're still waiting on X, Y and Z to come in. It's just that regular contact so that they don't feel like their loved one has been forgotten. Um, we also work very closely with the coroner support service, which is referred to in the report. Um, they're very good at giving pastoral care and they also have a number of organisations as well that will support the families uh, and explain processes in addition to what we're giving them at our level as well. I suppose again just just to add to that a number of families are legally represented and have more support through that route as to the process and what to expect but a number aren't and what we do is, is make sure those that aren't we take a bit longer to explain what what is like to happen uh, how things are conducted and another I mean, the commoners will spend time making them feel as comfortable as you can in very difficult uh circumstances and i'm mean, sort of very conscious they you know it, it is difficult and it, it is extremely just you know, stressing for for, for people so uh there's always always more we can do uh but, you know very very conscious to do what we can thank you very much henry you're next thank you chess so my question revolves around the uh, the backlog that was mentioned at the beginning um i'm trying to work it out from the numbers given in the paper but in i don't know if you can give this right now but Understandably, due to COVID, there has been a significant backlog in, in cases being resolved. So in simplistic terms, what is the current backlog and when or if might we uh, envisage that being cleared? So I've been trying to work it out from the percentages and numbers in the report, albeit my maths is known to be quite terrible. So I wondered if you had a, a swifter answer for me. So the, the, the back, backlog, as you can imagine, from month to month, it, it changes. We get cases coming in, cases going out, in course opening and closing. So I, I think the moment I would still stick around that two, two nine seven is is the, the near enough the figure. Give or give or take, uh, probably ten. Either way is the figure we I'll go with at the moment. Uh, what we wanted to do is get to a position where we, we're tracking it as they come in. Uh, that that position because at the moment it's very difficult. We report at a particular time of the year. Uh, nationally those those figures go off and and to be honest it also depends on the approach you want to take so we last year we very much focused on the oldest cases and some of those are some of the very hardest and difficult ones to uh, to take forward because the complexities around those uh you could for example very much focus on those that are just about to tip over the into the 12 months uh that would improve the figures but actually are you really dealing with the more difficult ones that we need to get over for those people have been waiting the longest so there's a balance to be found there between getting the number down what I, what I can't do is give you uh, a straight assurance around a period because the numbers fluctuate as well so we, we we also can get referrals in that we're instructed to take on uh, by the chief uh, coroner for other jurisdictions because of conflicts of interest in that jurisdiction and, and you know we have one at the moment that it, that is a very complex time-consuming case so these things also happen that have an impact uh, on our, our ability. I think for me, it's very much about trying to control those elements that we can control. So, you know, that we ourselves as a service aren't delaying things. You know, if reliant on an expert witness, there's not a lot we can do around their availability, providing we're, we haven't sat on the case to get the information to them, that we're not seeing if there's any support that we can give to that witness to enable things to move along, along quicker. But what we are keen to do for sort of future performance reports to the committees to be able to uh show you not just what was the figure that reported previously but actually what has come in come in and gone out during during that that period and, and, and again that's what we're working with the systems people to do to be able to produce those reports because at the moment some of that retrospective becomes a sort of hugely time consuming manual process but we want to know with the finger how are things doing because it's really important that we understand from any interventions we make those that are effective uh, and, and those that actually it hasn't delivered the improvement that we, that we wanted to. Uh, what, what we have seen, as I, as I say in the past, and, and again, it was picked up on Paul's, Paul's comments in relation to uh, the finances. So we did put injections from funds to bring in more staff effectively to address the backlog, but we didn't have the internal staff to support that. 
uh, and then because of the the pandemic and increased costs associated with pathology but things taking longer because the precautions they're taking in hospitals that effectively took the funding so it's not a, just as easy in this respect of providing the funding that's going to to deliver x amount of cases at a particular time because of the differences around them it's not uh, perhaps the, the answer we're looking for but i think just trying to spell it it is complex so what we are doing is we're just making sure we've got the resource focused on on the, the right areas and the data to, to underpin whether we are or, or not improving thank you very much anybody else this point okay thank you very much both of you or all three of you um we seem to be um the consensus in support of the uh, recommendations um anybody disagree no okay we'll take those um, recommendations unanimously And we'll move on to item eight, which is the performance monitoring report. Um, we've got the first um, report of the financial year uh, represented by Paul and our senior analyst, Jack Russell. Doesn't appear to be here, but Paul. Jack, Jack's online, Jack. Yeah. On, online, my apologies, Jack. Um, so just to remind members um, that there was a council-wide review of key performance indicators that led to a series of workshops led by Business Intelligence. Um, and there was a workshop for this committee back in April, um, which discussed uh, a number of proposed key performance indicators for the services under the purview of COSMIC. Um, interesting session for those of us who like those things. Um, and that did result in some amendments uh, and therefore a group of key performance indicators that were presented to and agreed by subsequent committee decision. <laughs> And those are set out at section 1.4. So they're the key performance indicators that we have decided represent our best uh, way of assessing business as usual for the services that fall under the remit of this committee. Um, this is the first quarter, uh, as the chair said, uh, on reporting of these. So uh, to some extent, uh, they represent a work in progress. Some indicators have not been measured or reported before. Um, so work is ongoing to establish baselines for them. Um, so we will see uh, this indicator pack uh, developing its presentation, at least uh, as we move on through the quarters. Um, section two reminds members of the of the services that are under the purview of committee. Um, and then at three, section three describes how the performance ratings are described in the subsequent table. Uh, a red, amber, green, blue system is used um, and the um, colour coding is identified and described at 3.2 uh, and later in that section a uh, description of um, the use of the phrases baseline in development and contextual. Um, the data as I say is for quarter one. Um, apologies um, when we come to the agenda forward plan we should add that the quarter two data which is now available should be ready for December committee so we will bring quarter two data to, to subsequent committee. Um, I have mentioned to spoke so Jackie's online but what we don't have online is uh, are the service leads for each of the individual services so if there are any technical questions on the performance of any individual services as indicated to, to group spokes they may have to be taken away. Uh, and, and in for future meetings as we circulate performance data, if you have any questions regarding the performance of individual services, of course, I would uh, I would ask members to, to try and contact us in advance so that we can uh, have, have um, responses prepared for committee. Um, so that's the cover report. There's much more detail uh, in the appendix. Uh, I have one correction to make to the appendix in indicator 222. Um, Trading standards, there is an indicator regarding percentages of businesses brought into compliance in priority areas following inspection. That reads 100% in the circulated documents and should have actually read 55%. So my apologies for that error. I'll leave it there, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, any questions or comments on agenda item, Philippa? Yes, these are very useful. Um, obviously, they're going to be used in different ways as far as different bits of the service are concerned. Um, something quite obvious would be the libraries, because we all are identifying they're a bit library orientated in this meeting today for, for various reasons. Um, and I'm just wondering how far one can get the detail. I mean, I 
protecting conversation with Councillor Cox Condren. There was a certain rivalry between Arbury and um, Trumpington, and which has got the best library. Now, that's a bit of trivial, but you, um, on the other hand, we obviously will be interested seriously in the performance of the libraries in our division or in our district. Um, and presumably that information is there because this is all added up to give us what we're seeing today. Um, how does one get hold of that? Is that um, secret? I'm sure it's not. <laughs> I'm sure it's not a secret. It's not the fact. It's not known to me <laughs> as I sit here today. Um, we do have a library report coming um, at, to December committee. Um, so I'll speak to the head of libraries, Gary Porter, and we'll discuss how we can get that kind of performance information. Um, I like you assume that the data presented. Um, is collated from smaller um, bits of data that, that are uh, added up cumulatively, but I will double check that. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Hilary? Thank you. Just just continuing with libraries and looking at the, the figures here, I just really wanted to give a bit of a shout out to the Library Presents programme as well, and just how important that was during um, the COVID period and in, in keeping people engaged and through our libraries and through culture and outreach. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Are we all content with the, the recommendations here? I think we are. So we'll take those on block. And we're going to conclude by looking at the committee's agenda plan. Um, are there any updates from offices or comments from members on this? Mm -hmm. Just to reiterate my previous comment, Chair, that we will bring quarter two performance report to that uh, to December meeting as well. Thank you. So if there's no comments um, from members, um, our next committee meeting, as I said, will be on the 8th of December. So thanks to everyone for, for attending. And I declare the meeting closed. Just to remind members that we have a workshop on um, equality, diversity and inclusion between two and three. That's available online as well, isn't it? Is that right? Yeah. 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 So don't feel you have to stay here until two o'clock. <laughs> but thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.